Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge. And the judge may hand you over to the officer. And you may be thrown in prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gorge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into Gehenna. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into Gehenna. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Well, that's humbling. <laughs> or scary. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Look, Ma, no hands. <laughs> We are sinners, one and all. Last week, Pastor Kevin preached on that verse that's right before this passage where Jesus says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, and those were the people best at keeping God's law, there was nobody better. Unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So just in case we're not sure what that righteousness might look like, today Jesus kindly gives us several examples. And in case we thought Jesus might give us some kind of loophole or some way around the law, I can tell you that's not going to happen. In fact, Jesus sets the standards higher. He says, you've heard the ancient law, you shall not murder. But I tell you, if you are so much as angry with a brother or a sister, if you call someone raka or brainless idiot or stupid fool, you are on the brink of the hell fires burning in Gehenna. Gehenna was the valley below Jerusalem, and it was the dump grounds, it was the trash pile. And there were always, you could always see a little flame, or at least smoke, smelly smoke, rising from Gehenna. And if you weren't careful, you might go right to Gehenna. <coughs> or, you have heard the ancient law, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you, if you just look at someone lustfully, you've committed adultery. You've broken the sixth commandment. And in case you want more, you can read the rest of the chapter. Jesus goes on with several more paragraphs about, you have heard the ancient law say, but I say to you, and you hear it for several more verses. So if you think God's law is mostly about threat. You know, do this and you're toast. If you think that's the way God's law is working, then Jesus, Jesus has just upped the ante. If the rules of God were not tough enough beforehand, Jesus has just cranked up the tension. And Jesus is talking here to regular people, not just the Pharisees who were so righteous and not just folks we might consider scum of the earth and evil and wrongdoers, Jesus is talking to regular people. People who usually try to follow the rules, they don't break the laws, people, people like us. And he's talking circumstances that he knows we have all experienced in one way or another. And Jesus is including, including thoughts, not just 
actions. I suspect most of us here today could say with some pride, hey, I'm a pretty good person. I'm, I'm not perfect, but at least I haven't killed anybody. <laughs> and as an NCIS fan, I agree, not having killed somebody is really very good. I totally agree with that. But you know, most folks have not murdered somebody. In fact, for most folks to say don't commit murder sets the bar pretty low. Most of us can do that. I like low bars. High bars, not so much, because high bars require me to pay attention to <coughs> my hurtful words or my hateful anger or, or stuff that goes on that, that you can't see, but it dwells right there in our hearts. Jesus raises the bar when he includes our thoughts in God's law. He adds those in to God's law. It's kind of hard to be self-righteous when you know your thoughts are under scrutiny. You know, back in those days, people pretty much thought the law meant your actions, but now Jesus expands that. He says your thoughts, your thoughts are also under scrutiny. Is that fair? Anger. Jesus has never driven down Main Street Fredericksburg on a Saturday. <laughs> or I-10 during rush hour in San Antonio. Lust? Jesus never had to stand in the grocery line where, you know, if you don't keep your eyes on, on the gum and the chapstick, there are all those pictures of gorgeous, beautiful people, sometimes in swimsuits. Jesus didn't have to do that. People may see our actions, but God sees our thoughts and our desires. And Jesus, Jesus won't let us off the hook. There are four main reasons that Jesus won't let us off the hook. And I know we're, we're talking today, as well as last Sunday with Pastor Kevin, some heavy theology, because this last part of chapter five, you gotta have some theology there to even begin to understand what is going on in this part of the Sermon on the Mount. Because it is obvious, as I say, Jesus won't let us off the hook, and there are at least four reasons. Number one, Jesus affirms that God is holy, and we are not. Would you repeat after me? God is holy. I am not. That's the basic first thing. God alone is pure and righteous and we are not. And the evidence would be our thoughts and our deeds. Number two, Jesus holds high the kingdom of God. That's the new world that God is at work creating out of this old sinful world, a new creation. And it begins in Jesus and with Jesus. And then it goes to his followers. And then his followers tell others. And so there is this movement, this following of Jesus in creating this new world. And the day will come when Jesus completes it. Not yet, but the day will come. And in this new world or this new kingdom that Jesus envisions, not only will we not kill, but we will not reduce our fellow human beings to, to fools. We will not kill people by sabotaging a reputation or poisoning a relationship or any of the stuff that goes on within our hearts that cannot be seen. We will not cause someone to suffer. We will not make people objects instead of human beings. And the church, the church is a movement of the kingdom of God. We're not a building, we are a people. And we are a people of the movement of the kingdom of God. And Jesus holds this kingdom high. 
good for him. What else would you expect? He holds the kingdom high. He raises the bar. Number three. Jesus names sin, sin. It's not just a sickness. It's not just, oops, the mistakes we've made. It's not just lawlessness. Sin, in fact, is a broken relationship with God. Sin is everything that takes us away from the fullness of the life of God. And so Jesus names sin and sins. And that, that puts us all on level ground. You know, he said we're all sinners, not one above another. We're all on level ground. The, the team goes out to play. We're on the same field. We're not one above the other. It's level ground that we're on. Some years ago, Barbara Brown Taylor wrote a book, and it was called Speaking of Sin. And the subtitle was, the language of salvation. And she called on Christians not to lose or to hide the word sin. She said, 21st century Americans don't use it much. We kind of put it out of our vocabulary. But she says, don't do that. Please don't do that. She says, if we weaken the language of sin, we also weaken the language of grace. She writes, the full impact of forgiveness cannot be felt apart from the full impact of what's been forgiven. Naming the sin is a hopeful kind of action. Recognizing that something is wrong is the first step in that thing being made right again. If you think about it, there's... There's not a lot of help for those who don't admit they need some help. And, you know, there's no repair if you think that nothing is broken in life. But to be able to name sin, sin, whether it's an individual wrongdoing or whether it is a, a social injustice that is embedded in our culture or in our society, Name sin, sin. It is a step toward forgiveness and reconciliation and healing. And those are the things of the kingdom of God. And finally, number four. Jesus knows that God's law has its place. And its place is not salvation. It has nothing to do with our saving or our salvation. That belongs to Jesus Christ by His grace. But law does have its place. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. Law, on the one hand, is God's gift to the whole world. Not just Christians. It's a gift to the whole world. Law civilizes us. It puts a restraint upon wrongdoing and evil and sin. And it works to protect and it works to help societies and cultures function throughout the whole world. So law is a gift, first of all, to the whole world. And for us as Christians, as well as for our fellow Jews, the law, the law lets us know God's will <coughs> and God's dream and God's imagination for this old world as he works on it becoming a new world. But you know what the main purpose of law is? The main purpose is that it drives us to Jesus Christ. The law drives us to Jesus Christ. You may remember last Sunday, Pastor, Pastor Kevin talked about the, the great trade that happens, the happy or the great exchange that, that Jesus trades out His righteousness for our sins. He takes upon Himself our sins and gives us this, this trade out, gives us His righteousness, places it in our heart. And so Martin Luther said that the law is preached in order to make sin manifest and to prepare hearers 
for the gospel. That gospel that Jesus has traded our sins for his righteousness. We are driven to Christ by the law, to the saving gospel. Today, you hear Jesus talk about things that probably won't get you thrown in jail. They might if you took them to the extreme, but probably they won't get you arrested. Anger, name calling, lust. But you know, even those, those things, Jesus gives this warning. He, he talks about to avoid those things, pluck out your eye, cut off your hands, get thrown out into the garbage dump of Gehenna. And you think, wow, who can possibly stand? With the bar raised that high, who can possibly stand? Well, you. You, my child, Jesus says, you shall stand, sinner and saint, accused and forgiven. You shall stand. With law and gospel, Jesus says, I will take your hand and I will raise up the humble and the kingdom of God. <coughs> kingdom of God shall come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. We hope you have been blessed by this presentation from Bethany Lutheran Church in Fredericksburg. We invite you to worship with us on Sunday mornings at 8, 1025, or 1030 a.m. Please like, share, and subscribe this video so that you can help spread the good news of Jesus Christ.